Hello and welcome once again to the Fair Game podcast, We Love You Football. I'm Graham Miller and in this episode we'll be focusing on arguably the biggest potential change in domestic football since the introduction of the Premier League. It's the appointment of an independent football regulator. Romantics see it as a handsome sheriff riding into town to bring order to the wild west of English football. The cynics, well, they fear something somewhat different. We don't yet know all the details, but the job of regulator was announced in the King's speech, so we know something is going to happen. Our three experts today have clear views on what they would like to see and perhaps the reality of what we're likely to get. But first, as usual, let's hear the latest Fair Game news from CEO Niall Cooper. It's an awful lot going on right now in the world of fair game with the independent regulator imminently about to start. Literally just last week, we had the announcement of a new interim chief operating officer for the regulator, which just shows how close we are to those changes that we've all been after. For us here at Fair Game, we've been busy on our research and literally in the next couple of days, we're expecting to release details of our good governance code, what a regulator should really look like and an environmental position paper, all there to help politicians understand that the changes we need can be done. And if there was any doubt on the need for a regulator, it's also come in several guises over the last few days. We've seen crisis happening at Morecambe, the continuing debacle at Reading, and of course, all that's happening at Everton. Meanwhile, there's been the announcement of a new TV deal for the Premier League with a whopping £6 billion plus in the offing. So I think it's time for those Premier League clubs to share a little love and share it down the pyramid as we've long been calling for. Let's see that money used to reward well-run clubs and properly change the future and the culture of football that we've all been longing for. And finally, a couple of big things in the world of fair game clubs. Just this week, we're expecting to announce all fair game clubs will become associate members of the Union of European Clubs, putting the likes of Lincoln City, Ebbsfleet United, Tunbridge Angels in the same bracket as the current leaders, the Belgium League, the Latvian champions and Oceana of La Liga, taking that membership of that organisation to a whopping 150 clubs. That is a real momentous shot in the arm for all of us here at Fair Game as we look to change football, not just here, but across Europe. And OK, one last thing. A little bit of pat on ourselves on the back here that we've just been and heard that we've been nominated, shortlisted even, for the International Sports Award for Innovation. Recent winners include Liverpool FC, just to give you a flavour uh, of how well we're doing. So huge thanks to all of you who support Fair Game. Now back to Graham and today's podcast. <laughs> Niall, thank you very much. Niall, of course, has been a key player in highlighting the need for a regulator through his work at Fair Game, and he's on our panel today. We're also joined by Henry Winter, Chief Football Writer for The Times, and by Tom Scotson, who's written extensively about football's challenges for the online news outlet Politics Home. To be seasonal and to slightly misquote Tiny Tim, welcome everyone. Henry, let's start with you. What are you hearing? Will it turn out to be what football needs or is some fear a political fudge? It all depends on who they appoint. If it's a political appointment, a Ken Clark figure, then that is a, a concern. If it's a respected KC who has got the uh, the self-belief and the knowledge and the argumentative skills and the patience, then I think it's... Well, first, it's needed. Everyone, I think, can can see that. You know, there's, there's no debate. Anyone who covered the... Uh, the European Super League plotters and the reaction of the fans just knew that actually enough was enough. And actually, you couldn't trust the Football Association or the Premier League with a, a pretty a number two of a leader in Richard Masters, his no Scudamore, and no one could bring the owners into line. And the fear of the owners from fans, from the media is 
it just means that a regulator, what did you call it, a sheriff riding into town, I don't care if they're handsome or ugly, we just need someone to to bring some order to, to the Wild West. We don't want, I mean, I was outside Bury when it was dying on its feet and it, you know, you don't want that. I think Neil's a, a Wimbledon fan. You saw the, the disgraceful treatment of them. And obviously that was a few years back. You're a Luton fan, things that have happened to you down the years. The owners, you can't, there's so too many owners you can't trust. So absolutely, we need a regulator. You've touched on it a little bit, the right person for the job. What specific skills do you think they need? What kind of background should they have? And who would you put in the hot seat? Well, the most encouraging, I was at the Football Supporters Association Awards last night and everyone was talking <laughs> positively about Martin Henderson being appointed. He is the uh, the CEO of the Sports Ground Safety Authority. One of those people who works tirelessly in football, completely respected. I think he was a turnstile operator at Bolton Wanderers, if, if memory serves. So he's sort of steeped in the game, in the pyramid, and this is very much about protecting the pyramid as well as protecting the elite clubs from uh, f- from owners who might not have who might just be interested totally in money and might be sort of ultimately mess around these great institutions. So look, Martin Henderson, I think that's a fantastic point. So basically, what happens with the regulator and and Tom will be far more in tune with these things than I am. But it seems like a shadow regulator effectively comes in to get it up and running which is actually really good because there's some people at the premier league and some of the uh the critics of a regulator in the media and you know there's some in my paper that you know there are scattered around a few of the refuseniks still sort of circling the wagons a little bit and the but someone like martin henderson coming in effectively early next year i think that's fantastic because it needs to be cracked on with and if you speak to government and you speak to starmer Everyone's on side with this, partly because they know it's a vote winner, because the fans or this, you know, came from Tracy Crouch's fan led review. Um, but Martin Henderson is an outstanding appointment. Everyone who I spoke to last night from all sides of the the divide on this was saying what a respected individual he is. So I think in a way the government has slightly wrong footed the, um, the the critics by appointing Martin Henderson, and then. It has to be a, a top ranking KC, someone who understands regulation, someone who can take on uh, some of the American owners, some of the other owners, and also someone who is respected in government. And he will able to be bring in the sort of the, the laws to impose if they do get out of line. Right. I want to touch on that a bit more in a, in a while. But, Tom, first, the regulator's frame of reference is another significant area if it is to be the success we want it to be. What would you lay down as imperative for the role? Well, I think that the main thing that we've got to see is, and I think this is what a lot of MPs have been calling for, is a greater fan input. I think that what Henry alluded to there, particularly with the Super League and so many clubs falling by the wayside because of poor ownership, that what most MPs want to see from both sides and what I'm hearing from Parliament is that's going to be a crucial element. But also as well that what the regulator... I think will happen, especially to start off with, it'll be tightly gripped towards the financial elements of it because MPs on both sides know this is a really big task that we were expecting to see. Potentially it was first read at the end of November, but government sources were concerned that this is such a huge project to live with, deliver, that they have to delay it necessarily to get absolutely every detail right because it'll infringe on all of our lives of course that football is such a huge cultural phenomenon within the UK and particularly English football that they're really having to take the time and look at it so I think it's going to be tightly scoped around the financial element but also as well getting the right uh, and the fa- right fan input within clubs particularly from all the way from the Premier League down to the National League. Football is very complex we know that are there any areas do you think that the regulator should not be involved in? I think that to, the, one of the things that MPs were very concerned that particularly was something like diversity. Now, there's even Stuart Fuller that I was having a conversation with, and he is someone that was part of the fan led review and also the former Lewis chairman only up until around a month ago. And I think the element was is that even though something to do with diversity and inclusion on the face of it sounds very good, how you would implement that in practice. Because I remember he recalled when we were having a conversation that the difficulty was is even though they were trying to get a more diverse board on football clubs all the way from the Premier League to the Championship League 1 and League 2, 
but particularly even lower down, it was very difficult to really try and mirror society's image onto football clubs. So I would say that maybe broad ranging policies such as that are more difficult to implement at first. I think that those, even though they sound brilliant in theory, I think the government should be wary about imposing such policies right now just so it doesn't make a hash of something that, as we said, is, is so important as seen by many fans and voters as a really important policy that's been demanded for a long time. Now, you've described the introduction of this regulator as an historic moment for football. As we wait for the details, are you confident or just a little bit apprehensive? Well, Graham, I'm a little bit apprehensive. Um, I think there is a, um, a lot that can go wrong between now and when it actually comes in. The fact that we're at that stage is a huge uh, step forward. You know, it really is. I mean, we've needed this for a long time. It's the many cases of clubs that have collapsed we, we're fully aware of. Now, for me, I think Tom touched on a, a few a bits there that were interesting. You know, it's about how how far is that remit of that regulator? Because in the when you start analysing the cultural change that's needed within the game, that's quite deep. Um, and that is... It's about how brave the politicians are with the actual final bill and what they actually do. I totally take Henry's point. I think it's really valid about having the person who heads that regulator having the strength and the skill. And I think when you're talking about a high quality lawyer or, or a legal person, that's probably needed because there's going to be an awful lot of lobbying, an awful lot of experts trying to look at every little way of getting out of this, every little loophole. Um, and that's why the rigorousness and the um, removal of any vested interest in an independent regulator is absolutely vital. Because if we have any of that at any level, then we're going to we risk repeating a lot of the mistakes that we've already seen. Um, and as you know, Graham, we're a big advocate of also trying to look at uh, introducing the carrot as rather than just the stick. So the kind of rewarding well-run football clubs and trying to look at um, supporting the smaller clubs to be able to implement these changes. I think those are. Uh, really important steps but I think it does need to have that really robust person at the top that can stand up to the Premier League because between now and when it actually starts there's going to be an almighty fuss um, about it and you know I, I, I imagine the Premier League aren't going to be making the same sort of mistakes that they did with the um, well with the, the top six maybe with the ESL so I think there's going to be far more uh, concerted efforts to uh, to derail it and hopefully, I mean, there are some good clubs in the Premier League. I'm sure Henry could probably name them. They might they wouldn't take very many, but like you know, there are some ones that are keen to actually uh, look at working with the regulator and trying to get be, be productive. But it's it's going to be a real challenge. Um, and those are the bits we need to come through because it's you know you're, you're basically talking the David in this case and the Goliath, but the David happens to be several million Davids, and there's only one Goliath. It's whether those Davids can all um, club, club together and make that difference. To give you the confidence you're looking for, what should be the number one item on the inbox? Well, I'm going to talk about fair financial flow of an independent regulator. That that for me is 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 really top of it, um, and that that's that's quite a challenge uh, because that's about trying to incentivise good behaviour within football clubs. That for me feels like what I would put as number one. Uh, I think there are a whole bunch of other things that are really important. I mean, you, you do talk about proper owners and directors test. You talk about good governance. I would talk about quality standards, uh, proper fan engagement, the golden share. There's so many things that are really important in the game. And we need to look at trying to embed all of that. When um, Tracy Crouch first stood up and did the family review, she did say that it, it isn't a menu. You have to take the whole thing. You know, you can't just pick and choose because it's all it's all massively interrelated. And I think that's that's the cru really crucial bit. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of our clubs and they will say, right, we can get reform. But if we don't have actual financial redistribution and reallocation down the pyramid, then it's it's going to be really hard. And that actually does mean looking at the reward because we've had penalties. We've had to stick for a long time. Um, and like Graham, you, you know it as, as a, a Luton fan. I know it as a Wimbledon fan. Everton fans know it at the moment. You know, are we actually going to see any change on the back of all these big things? Oh, I just have that little bit of a doubt about penalties. Um, and I think we really need to look at, start uh, changing that culture. It's, and it's a big, big controversial thing. I know it. Uh, I'm fully aware of it because football's never looked at it that way. But um, I think it's particularly when you've got an, a new TV deal that's in the, you know, yeah. I'll add an extra billion. 
Henry, you, you've mentioned Martin Henderson's appointment as chief operating officer. Does that give you the confidence that they are taking the whole thing seriously? Yeah, I thought it was an inspired appointment. And just everyone. Why, that... why, say, why so? Because he's he's genuine. He doesn't come in with an agenda. He appreciates football at all levels. He's he's just one of the good guys in football. Um, genuine, experienced, respected on you know Premier League, EFL. So uh, absolutely. But I, I take I take Niall's point about the uh, the sort of the, the fans having their involvement. But ultimately, this has to be an office with whatever it is, 30, 40, maybe more staff, almost like a sort of Scotland Yard for football, just going out and checking on these clubs with a KC at the top. It can't be sort of Lord of the Flies with sort of loads of sort of fans sort of running around sort of advising on things. The fans, as always, and we've we've seen it down the years, are the early warning systems. They will light the beacons around the country when there are issues at individual clubs or with sort of themes within the game. And absolutely, that's when the, the regulator has to respond. But I think the regulator has been a success already. And he or she has not even started work because you look at the Premier League, they've uh, effectively looked at the owners and directors test. They've responded to that. You look at the Football Association, they've responded on their governance side to the possibility and now the inevitability of an independent regulator coming in. Ditto the EFL as well. So it's had an impact, whether that's them saying, oh, look, we can keep our house in order. The sad thing is the Football Association has no power. They lost that in 1992 when the Premier League came into force. So this is about having a strong enough unit with a KC at the top. I mean, you said, well, so what sort of character should it be? It has to be someone with experience of governance, of regulation, of the legal world, and most importantly, with the strength of character to stand up to these clubs. From a fan's point of view, will a regulator, the type of person you've just discussed, will he or she be able to save a Berry or any of the other clubs that are on the, the precipice? Well, I think though there has to be an early warning system of actually, so you have the owners and directors test and people have legitimately got through and then turned out to be sort of charlatans or unable to, to finance the, the, the club. There has to be rigorous, constant checks. It's like a monthly MOT on a club just to check where their finances are, which doesn't really happen properly at the moment. Whereas I think an independent regulator could certainly do that. You could just have individual clubs, which you are concerned about because the fans have been highlighting issues. The media have been highlighting issues. We can name sort of four or five at the moment, as Scunthorpe, but as, as South End, clubs like that, and just send effectively government accountants in there just to check on these things. And I, I absolutely, again, take Noel's point about the carrot, but this is about the stick. This is about Whitehall's power. This is about, and I'm not a huge fan of, of interference, but having been through many reviews and reports that in the 35 years I've been covering this, I don't trust them. I don't trust probably about half of the owners. They're good people in there, like Steve Parrish, who understands and loves the game. Um, but there are too many with the wrong motives and that is why we need someone strong in Whitehall. Tom, uh, Henry just used that word interference. Do you believe, are you confident the game can work within a, a regulatory landscape that's been going a long time without? I mean, it seems that people within government seem to think that they are confident that this can work. Again, that Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, again, it's got to be seen within the political paradigm. But again, that this was one of the policies that he put uh, front and centre of his King's speech. This was trailed to the Financial Times just before it to show fans and voters that this was a policy that he wanted to push. It seems that, again, that Stuart Andrew, the, the sports minister, um, even not a massive professed sports or football fan, uh, has been confident and been pushing this behind the scenes, according to MPs. It seems they are confident. I think the one thing that hasn't necessarily been raised by MPs, because I think many of them are scared that they don't want to upset many of their own core voters, who, of course, will be uh, very loyal football fans, is that there are many problems within football. But even with saying that, is it still, even with the many problems, still one of Britain's, and well, Britain's most successful uh, institution and a huge cultural export? And I think what we have seen, particularly within the political sphere, is things can always get worse, however pessimistic that does sound. And I think that 
many people setting up the football regulator and government need to realise that however dire the situation can be within football, I think we've seen dozens of football clubs, I think it's 60 football clubs, uh, have gone busted into liquidation since 1992. And of course, no one of course, wants to see that. But it's just worrying that, as we said, can the regulator necessarily stop this? But also as well that could we make the leagues less competitive and then lose that advantage to foreign national leagues? Because there's one um, advisor in government did tell me um, and an advisor to MP is that it was such a global now sporting network we've got. It's not like maybe decades ago where they just support rival teams within the country. People could just go and support PSG, Real Madrid with all the TV deals they've got and lose that kind of local um, local tie that people have with football clubs. So it's just maybe one of the warning signs to, to bring in with a football regulator. On the on the um, the bit about the, uh, the the kind of warning signs. Now uh, there are a lot of already existing systems that can show that so there is a there is efl did have and do to some extent have uh, an automated system that where clubs are supposed to report in all monthly that would if that's put properly implemented properly introduced would show you red flags so you'd be able to start seeing warning signs much early which is the problem with a lot of the clubs because the accounting can be up to i think 27 months out of date so you would have the bury for example would have definitely been saved had that been in place because the red flags would have gone up far earlier. So there are ways of doing it. So when everybody gets a bit skeptical about, Oh, can you do it? Can you, whatever. A lot of the things that we talk about are already in place. Like, you know, there is good governance codes that are actually really effective that can come in place. You know, there is a way you can do that. Sport England already have reporting systems that look about how you do that government. So there's a whole load of interactive things that are very easy just to transfer across to football. So the kind of all the kind of sceptical voices go, oh, this is going to be too much here and too much there and too much there. It already is out there. It already exists. It's going to just take a bit of training and a bit of explanation to make it into place. And that's where, again, I go back to Henry's point. I think the appointment of Martin as a COO, because it's that operational side that's going to be really key to making this work. That's where having somebody respected from him and also from the, the framework where he comes from, because it is, there are so many organisations like the Football Foundation that have so many criteria that make it actually doable. And that's where I think it's really impossible, really possible. So this whole argument that it's going to be too difficult or it's going to be awkward should just be banished as well, because they all do exist. The, the really reality is it can be done. Um, for us, I think the same applies to the fair financial flow in football and the, 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 the carrot side. We can go into that for a length, but I won't because I think the positive side of it is you know so good and so important for fans um and i don't see fans as being part of that regulator i see fans as being enshrined in certain elements of which the regulators should bring in so the kind of protection of the golden share you know the the, the club colors the name the badge where a club pays all of that i think is things that the regulator needs to ensure and enshrine and you can do that for articles of association you can do all of that and you can do tests and i, I totally go with henry's point of you know, it's a bit like a Scotland Yard, you know, let's go and get these people with real strong investigative powers to go in and check these clubs out and make sure they are running in the right way. Um, and that, that I think is, again, really doable. You know, it just takes the right person to top. We've got all the kind of uh, facilities. We've got all the kind of mechanisms. Um, and I see it as really exciting. What I'm interested in from Henry and Tom is a bit about is who are the blockers? Who are the people going to be throwing up the kind of barriers to stop all this happening? Because, you know, I say that it's all there. All the all the the bricks are all there. All the kind of foundation stones are there. But there's going to be some people who are going to go mm, over my dead body, and I just want to know who those who those potential assassins are. Well, and that, that's for me what I find really interesting. Isn't it a case that the elephant in the room is the Premier League, Henry? I mean, you know, how is there a battle to be to be fought and won? Uh, yes, still. I think that they are beginning to realise and you look at some of their appointments of uh, former government employees to try and give them some teeth to fight against the uh, the regulator. That's why it has to be someone that they will respect and fear in a way with the, the KC. J j just on that, the my, my one concern is that whoever is appointed, and I know a couple of the names of the KCs who have been, you know, they're already sort of that canvassing and that looking at candidates, that process is ongoing. 
and the scrutiny that they will come under and maybe there might be one or two mischievous clubs out there who might sort of point certain journalists in certain directions they will the, the scrutiny will be huge so say it's take a kc people will go the media the fans will go through their social media accounts any of their public pronouncements any of the legal cases that they've been involved in particularly if it's in football and will say well how can they be fair to our club whichever club because they represented a rival that is going to be one concern because it's football and because it's what in the three most scrutinized subjects institutions in the country this kc the appointment they have to be so strong they have to know that they are walking into a far fight in terms of the fans interest in terms of the media scrutiny and also coming back to your point graham in terms of the opposition that they're going to get from the fans. So far, sorry, from the, the Premier League fans that obviously be very supportive. So it's got to be a strong individual. You, you talk about the, you know, the Premier League being the elephant in the room. They, you know, whenever you write about the, um, about the independent regulator, well, they've stopped now because they realise they've, they've lost the argument, but they will fight rear guard actions. But, and it will come down on two levels. First on philosophy. They don't like the idea of government interference in the worlds that they work in. And then also, as ever in football, it all comes down to money. You know, in this life, one thing counts, you know, in the owner's bank accounts, large amounts. And that is what they will look at. And that is why, I mean, coming back to now, now it's a very pertinent point you make about the, the, the fair financial flow. The only argument that they will understand, these owners, is self-interest. So when you write about the flow of money going down the pyramid, you have to explain it to them in terms of it will benefit them. So if you say, listen, you might have players in non-league who will rise up the two in the uh, in, in the England squad, you know, whether it's a Callum Wilson, uh, Nick Pope, sadly injured. You know, you need to protect the pyramid because these players who are playing down the pyramid and managers who are managing down the pyramid will eventually come and join you in the in the top six one day. So it's in your interest to have a strong foundation. It's the only language they understand is self-interest and finance. And uh, that is an argument the KC will fight on a daily basis. Tom, can you see that battle being won or is this going to go on for a long time, this firefight? Uh, yeah, I mean, from so Henry's very well equipped on the particular sporting side of that. and Those kind of firefights within the Premier League and the fans is not necessarily what I've picked up on particular. I've more focused on the parliamentary battles. And it's interesting because out of MPs, I'd say that there's going to be no cabinet ministers, junior ministers, senior ministers that are going to resign over this. This is not going to be a resignation watch um, issue. I could probably bet a large amount of money on that, thinking of talking to ministers, talking to MPs. Even within MPs, I think one MP told me that it was only the usual suspects within the Conservative Party that were against any form of regulation, but it was those that would cut across different issues, whether it's housing, whether it's energy, whether it's football. So again, you could probably expect maybe a bit in between five to ten MPs on the Conservative side. I think the main blocker that we've probably got to look out for coming through Parliament or Whitehall is the parliamentary timetable. And it's what the government decides to prioritise. Because even though, as we alluded to before, that this was front and centre of the King's speech, it was trailed before uh, the 7th of November, the thing they've got to look out for is that many MPs now are going back to the constituencies um, to campaign because they're worried about losing their seats in an election expected next year. They're only in Westminster maybe two, three times a week. So the government's really got to prioritise what bills are we bringing to the House? Which ones are we fighting? Is it going to be the Rwanda fine? Is it going to be housing? So therefore, depending on how much you can fit in within the next 12 months, that's going to be vital to see if we see a regulator in a year's time, never mind under a Labour, potentially Labour government. Don't you think it's an obvious vote winner? And they are look. They are needing a few vote winners looking at the, the polls for for the Tories because the majority of their constituents are going to agree that an independent regulator. You know, if you ask the average punter in the street, they say football's a wild west. The players get paid too much money. Need a little bit more discipline. And if that is embodied by an independent regulator coming in, that is a vote winner surely for the Tories. Oh, I agree, Henry. I, I think it's a vote winner. I think the main dividing line between this and just picking up the Rwanda policy is that. Football regulator, when it happens, could be a vote winner. But without it in the immediate term, I don't think that but that voters are going to think, why has it not been promised? Whereas something like a Rwanda policy that we've seen has dominated the news, if that has not been accomplished, 
or is not even set into law, or the government isn't seen to be doing something on that issue, that will cost them more voters. So I think it's more of a term of damage limitation at the moment of how many voters it can win back that it has already lost. But I agree with you completely that if, from having spoken to MPs, having spoken to the public and now different farm bodies, is that this is crucial and this could really claw back some support in some of the Heartlands that won in 2019 that, you know, we've got to remember that a lot of the clubs that are in League One, League Two are in many of these red wall seats that it needs to win back. We brought up the uh, that word money. Now, to somebody who's not interested in football, reading about the £6.9 billion pound TV deal that's coming in in a, what, a couple of years' time, they think, how on earth is it that uh, any football club is struggling to pay its bills? I mean, it is a remarkable amount of money, and it is astonishing that we have clubs on the breadline. That is because it's it's... As Henry says, it's about this self-interest stuff. And this is where I think having an independent regulator who can take a more holistic view of football is very important. Um, because when you think about the benefits of money trickling down the pyramid, and actually when I say that, and we, we talk about rewarding well-run clubs, it is about where that money goes. So if you start looking at it and going into the clubs that invest in infrastructure, they invest in community programmes, they invest in the academy, what that actually does is it creates an ecosystem of people who care about the game, which actually helps strengthen it at the lower end. And as we all know, I mean, like, what was it? 10 of the starting 11 from the Euro 2020 England team um, were from lower league clubs. You know, so that is that is where you get your strength. So if you can have that stronger academies, if you can have people that are, see their football club as a hub for their community, that's where you get the security of a club long, long term. You know, what? The, the clubs that we all talk about that have folded or gone into, you know, so much trouble, the only people that really step in at that moment is the local community. So the more stronger you have a connection with your community, the better it is. When you've seen that disconnect and you see the fans move away, that's when a club becomes much more at peril. That is good for the benefit of the whole game. It's beneficial for the national, to, national side. It gets more people interested in football, more people playing football. And actually that brings more money into the game long term. It takes somebody to be quite brave in the Premier League, some of the Premier League clubs, to be able to see that and break away from that, which isn't natural. You know, they're they're multi-billion billionaires. They're all thinking about their own self-interest. To actually have that holistic view is a bit where I think we've got to the point where a regulator needs to take that, uh, take that on board and take have a have that kind of sense of power about where football's money going. I'm not talking about sh- shelving loads and loads of money out of the Premier League. Far from it, and Premier League is a fantastic marketing tool, and we and you know they do a brilliant, brilliant job for for the English game. What I'm talking about is the extra bits, you know, an extra hundred thousand pounds at a lower league club is transformational. It doesn't pay a week's wages in the Premier League, you know that that's where that's the kind of difference you you need to be looking at, and that's where I think people have lost that reality about uh, what it's like to be a League One, a League Two, a National League, a National League North or South club. I mean, in the National League, you get as many people go to watch a National League game as watch Chelsea um, on a match day, on a Saturday. You know, so there's quite a lot of people watching that level of football and that's that's level five. So, you know, I think there we need to start thinking a bit more holistically. That's that's where I'm at. You've got my a little rant there, Graham, as sure. usual. No, no, no. <laughs> a levy on transfers has been floated for some time, Henry. Should that be a priority? And and somehow we make sure that that levy gets distributed to the pyramid, to the local. I've been writing about it for years. I think it's, I mean, there are elements of uh, levies anywhere in a FIFA levy, but absolutely it should be, uh, it it should be, it's again, you have to explain it to these clubs. There are good clubs out there. I've just quickly listed Palace, Brentford, Luton, your own Luton and Brighton, clearly brilliantly run clubs. You probably throw uh, Villa in there as well. So that's a quarter. Um, you know, there are exceptionally well-run, well-intentioned clubs who you don't want to sort of throw the stick at because they are doing great things in the community, on the pitch. Just another thing, just listening to the sort of, you know, the uh, um, Niall and Tom, the there is going to be a concern when the next owner comes in. And say it is, say the uh, the Qatari have wanted to uh, to take over, um, Prince Jassim, Sheikh Jassim wanted to take over Manchester City ahead of uh, Jim Rackland. It would be an interesting position that the government and the ind- the independent regulator would have been in to actually 
say should we bring someone like this in given the sort of the issues that are associated with qatar when the other side of whitehall is just on the trade side is doing so much probably the other side of the corridor is doing so much business with them and clearly um there are one or two people in government who had a word around the the saudi takeover of newcastle united because of the financial you know you've only got to go on the uh the, the, the sort of the DTI, whatever it is, website to see how many hundreds of millions of pounds of business we do with the Saudis. So that is, again, it comes back to, I think this is one of the biggest appointments in the history of English football, getting the right K KC for the next three, four years, someone who can withstand this pressure because the pressure is just going to be huge because the Premier League won't accept this. They'll, they'll come fighting back. So sorry, I've I've gone slightly round the houses, but this coming back to, I know the identity of a couple of the KCs who've gone for it, and I just think they're really strong individuals, and they will go in with their eyes open. But they are there is there is a little bit of an ambush waiting for them. All this foreign money, uh, Tom, Qatari money, and so on, as Henry's just been talking about, is that a talking point at Westminster? Is it a concern or or not? I think it will be. It has been privately. And I think it, it will continue to be. I mean, this is just another within the Department of Culture uh, anyway, which obviously includes football. But the, the sale of the Telegraph, of course, has been one that has been spoken about a lot. So this is also going to come under the same remit and the sale of you know huge institutions. So I think that it is also one of them. But it's a double-edged sword for the government as well, because, again, they're thinking primarily of the revenue that it can bring in, but also as well it's then the... We've got to think of the other side of maybe the potential of the, the human rights abuses that comes with it. I mean, we all remember, again, that Newcastle's takeover only recently. I mean, that caused such controversy, uh, especially within Parliament as well, and it caused, you know, so much, uh, so many problems. And I think, again, that as Henry said, and I think, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from your side, Henry, as well, particularly with the footballing element, that is this something that particularly fans and also, you know, owners of clubs, is this something that they're also talking about too and are concerned about particularly? And the majority of fans, Tom, aren't bothered about sports washing if they've got a decent team on the pitch. And if you look at Newcastle and the owners, Saudi's impact on Newcastle as a club and as a city, it is, you know, it is impressive. Now, I was a huge critic of them when they were, when uh, the takeover was ongoing um, because I'm not a huge fan of, of journalists being beheaded so you know amongst amongst many other issues human rights which you you rightly raise but they've actually been you know they've appointed a brilliant manager fantastic chief executive and darren eels brilliant football director director of football in dan ashworth the community side and you only have to go and look at what's happened in the east side of manchester around the etihad the academy that's come up there you know the uh, They've transformed an area which was pretty run down. And there was a great irony when they actually went into that area. The, there was so much, because there have been so many sort of factories there, they actually had to drill down and get rid of the, the pollution that was in the ground and the amount of petrol that was in the ground. And the irony of sort of, you know, the people who've made their money um, through oil, actually having to get rid of oil in the east end of Manchester. So, look, if you talk to City fans, they'll be absolutely delighted. But this is another thing the regulator is going to run into, even though sort of discipline, that element might not be a huge thing. But 115 charges, which apparently, according to the Daily Mail, are going to be heard later next year, that the charges of, a, of alleged financial uh, breaches, you know, that is, again, going to be a, a huge thing. You know, if they try to relegate Manchester City, because the regulator will be dragged into that, as well as the Premier League and the Football Association. So again, it is, you know, all this Wild West imagery is is completely right. But so what I'm saying is, even though there's an element of sports washing and it's PR and they are doing huge things in the community, we still can't escape from, even though a lot of the fans do, the fact that, you know, there have been shortcuts and there have been human rights abusers in the, in the countries. We then come back to that thing, should football be dealing, uh, doing business with people that the government says... You know, it's fine. It brings in work, so you know it's a it's a difficult argument. But the but coming back to your point, Tom, the majority of fans are absolutely fine. They'd have the Guardian if they got them messy. The one thing that um, is often overlooked when you talk about nation states owning football clubs is the um, the reality that actual nation states are also prone to the, the whim of a government. 
about which government's in favour, which country's in favour and which country's not. And so, I mean, we could be very honest here, that if the political wind was to change in a certain direction, you could quite easily see sanctions from a British government against Saudi Arabia or UAE at some point. That's where I think when you look at an ownership, owners and directors test that says nation states, and I, I think, honestly, any nation, um, she would, there needs to be huge question marks about whether she'd be allowed to own a football club because it's actually a financial sustainable risk um, that's often ignored because, you know, I, mean, I know Chelsea weren't, you know, Roman Abramovich wasn't the Russian, wasn't the Russian, you know, government, but the potential of where you can see that going uh, of a club suddenly being seen as a uh, persona non grata by a government simply because of their owners, that's where the risk is. So I think, the situation for the for the fans of Man City and Newcastle, they, they they should potentially have a little bit of nervousness about the whim of a government, uh, and that's where I think there needs to be a little bit more. It's not really often talked about, but this is another area that I think is is worthwhile exploring. But no, sorry, what once they're in, they're in surely. This is what's interesting about one of the things about the owners and directors test is because what's been mooted is that it's renewable, so the idea is that it's every year, so that you don't just have it and then that's it, job done is that you have to continually pass it. And that's what we talk about, constant scrutiny. That's one of the very clear things that they're trying to do, which would mean that effectively Man City and Newcastle will be under that same scrutiny every year. And if policy changes, or equally, uh, we have to remember that what happened with, I can't remember which one of the two clubs it was, it must be Newcastle, that they claimed they weren't the Saudi government and then they had the same group in America said they were the Saudi government, right? So actually... That would mean that on an owners and directors test, Newcastle potentially failed because of the argument they had wasn't actually valid because they changed to exactly the opposite a few months later in the States. But can you imagine the reaction of the fans if Starmer, if he Oh, is, no, Henry, it would be, it would be carnage. Yeah, yeah. It'd be absolute carnage. But the reality, that's that's the reality of where you, you've got to think about whoever comes on as your KC has got to have some tea because, you know, you've got to be able to look at these owners because they're going to change what they're investing in and what they're doing every single year. They're not, they're not just, they don't just sit around as these businessmen doing nothing. You know, they're what they do is going to be different. And that's why it needs to be the constant review. Henry, I mean, like, I'd love to, you know, I'm not saying I'd love it, but it would be such a fascinating drama to unfold if they went back and said, you know, that owners and directors test you passed when you said this, well, actually you've now said something else. We're renewing it. And you've, you failed your owners and directors test. I mean, that, that in reality, is potentially what could happen. Yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a, such a drama and such a, a fantastic soap opera to you know sit and watch unfold. But you know that's that's potentially what could be on on the cards. Wow, that's tin helmet time. So you're looking you're... at your little list, Henry, to of your KCs to see who's got the teeth to do that. Yes. Tom, you called it a vote winner, but we have an election coming up. Is there any danger it might be kicked into the long grass with everything else that's on board? I mean, there were rumours, particularly this is prior to the King's speech, that this would be shelved. But I think that I think the likeliest option is is that the government will get on with this. Uh, there will be a second reading and a shadow regulator before the Parliament is dissolved and there is an election. However, I think just because of the parliamentary time and if it is cut, if a May, if there's a May election, then it's definitely not being passed. If it's a January twenty five election or maybe a November twenty twenty four. There is a possibility, but again, it's going to be maybe the problem with the government and they're going to have to think about this before they manage to get the bill all the way through Parliament of, are they going to make a hash of it? And if so, are they going to be blamed for it? Now, again, if they think they can do something very competently within a year's time and then go to the public and say, we've done X, Y, Z, which includes the football regulator, I think they'd bite your hand off for achievement like that. But and also as well, I think Labour would also very happily if they win the next election, which looks more than likely, take a bill that is half completed, implement that within the first 100 days, maybe a year of their parliament, and then claim it as their achievement. So it's a win-win for the Conservatives. They can get it done within a year, but that will be contingent on them not calling an election for at least a year. We're coming to the end of our time. A quick word from each of you. Is it a last chance saloon for football? This Football is remarkably resilient. It goes through these waves, but it's just it is a it is a hugely important moment if they get the right individual in there for 
But even if the Wild West continues, football will still survive. It is just it's just extraordinary. It's like the black box on a plane. It, it's always there. But absolutely, the place would be a it would be a much better place, and there would be fewer clubs imperiled if they get the right independent regulator in and soon. Tom, I think that whatever happens now, the idea of a football regulator has come so far, especially within recent times, that this idea is here to stay at least. And I think the regulators' remit is only going to become larger within the next few years. I think both parties have very much changed their economic stance. They're both much more, more interventionist, not just on economics, of course, but in wider society. And I think that's been shown in the Conservative and Labour parties. So whoever wins the next election, I think that if the football regulator hasn't already been implemented, it will be by the next government. Last word to you now. Yeah, I, I think that we, we are going to have a regulator. I think the, the question is, is how how strong is it? Does it have vested interest? And what's in that remit? But it's exciting times. And like Henry, like Tom, I think that we could see a, a far better future for football if it if it comes in. Um, and we've been waiting for this for an awful long time. Um, you know, certainly my hair gives me the kind of sense of that it is very grey. That's my kind of indication and uh, of how long I've been wanting something like this. So uh, I've got my fingers firmly crossed. Henry, Tom and Al, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're hopefully on the cusp of something positive and special for the future of the game. If you've enjoyed it, do please subscribe to the Fair Game podcast. You can find us on all the usual channels and we're on TikTok as well. I'm Graham Miller. The producer is Ian Beach. Thank you for listening. And until the next edition of We Love You Football, it's goodbye for now.